Hello everyone. So you've been wondering about model context protocol and what exactly is it and why is it plastered all over the internet on every channel that is talking about AI? Well, you've come to the right video because in this video, I'll be giving you a very simple introduction to MCP. And without further ado, let's get to it by breaking down the phrase model context protocol into two parts. The first being protocol. Protocol in general basically means a set of rules to follow in any sort of practice. In computer science or engineering, protocol basically defines a standard or a way for two devices to speak to each other. Not just two devices, two applications or just anything that needs to talk to each other, talks to each other via a protocol. For example, if you go to any website like this one over here, and this is the official documentation for MCP by the way, you will see over here there is HTTPS written. HTTPS is Hypertext Transfer Protocol and S stands for Secure. So this P is Protocol. That's what it stands for. It is a standard uh, on which certain websites operate. By certain I mean pretty much all the websites on the internet operate. So that's a protocol. Why is this protocol necessary? Well, like I said, it establishes a way for two different applications or systems or devices to communicate with each other. And so that defines how data is formatted, how it is sent, how it is received by the receiving device. And a protocol basically needs to be reliable. It needs to be efficient because what you send from here should be exactly what is received over there. That is what I mean by reliability. And because there is so much data shared across the internet, it needs to be efficient. It needs to be as small as possible, as concise as possible, as easy to understand as possible. That is what I mean by it being efficient. All right. So that is basically what I mean by protocol over here. And to put it in very, very layman terms, I would say that you are watching this video and I am speaking to you in English. I am speaking to you in this language and I hope that you understand English. We, so we've decided that English is the medium of communication for us. That is what we've, what we've established. What I established when I made this video, what you have established when you clicked on this video. All right. That is the protocol that we have established. Okay. Let's communicate in English. That is basically what devices use. So that is what I mean by protocol over here. Coming to the second phrase, second part of this phrase, that is model context. So model context, specifically context over here, basically means the information needed by your LLMs, your large language models, which could be your prompts. Prompts are nothing but the, the basically text that you write on tools like ChatGPT, like Claude, like Gemini, like DeepSeek, your prompts or some more information like some data sets or something like a file that needs to be processed by your AI application. For example, an audio file that needs to be converted to text. So that's your file or even a set of APIs. I'll move on to the small screen now. A set of APIs. Right? For example, if you wanted to send data to a certain uh, website's database, you can use APIs for that. So that's all the information you will need to provide to your particular uh, LLM, your large language model. So that is what MCP stands for. But why do we need MCP? To put it simply, it gives us a lot more options. We need MCP because it, like I said, establishes a standard. This standard will be adopted by many different companies to make different tools that your AI application can connect to. And so if more and more companies adopt a certain protocol like they did with HTTP to communicate between uh, websites and clients and servers, basically these tools will be more easily associable with your certain application. So when each company decides, okay, MCP is the protocol that we need to stick to, you will also be inclined to use it in your own application. And it's not just this, for example, if you are using uh, some audio to text tool, let's say made by a certain company, but then that company just decides to shut down for some reason. Now you have integrated it with your application. How can you then switch this out for, let's say, open AI's 
models, their APIs. So it will be difficult if there is no standard oper standard operating procedure for you to do so. So if both of these tools happen to use MCP, it will be easy for you to just switch between tools because now you know the standard of communication. You don't have to change a lot of components to get there. That's what I mean by more options. Now, what does this mean? USB-C port for AI applications. So that is basically defined in the official documentation itself. It's not something I'm coming up uh, with on my own. Anthropic, who basically uh, came up with this protocol, the company, who has also released the Claude AI tool for us, the LLM. They have defined MCP as a USB-C port for AI applications. What do they mean by USB-C port? Basically, you have USB-C ports on your mobile phone, on your laptops, on various other peripheral devices that you can use a cable to connect to and transfer data from one place to another. So that is what they say that, you know, if this USB-C port is common, now you have a common way of connecting certain components, certain devices, certain hardware. So they're just calling that as a USB-C port for AI applications. They said if you use MCP in your different tools, it will just be as easy as connecting uh, two devices via a USB-C cable. That's what they are going for over here. That is the intent behind this particular protocol. All right. So question is, how does MCP actually work? I mean, we've understood the benefits to some extent, at least I'll dig deeper now. But the question is, how does MCP really work? Where does this all come in in our AI applications? So I'll ask you to take two steps back and ask yourself, how do simple LLMs work? I'm not going to dive into the uh, internals of the machine learning algorithms. I'm just talking about you as a user. How do you use LLMs? So you give it a certain input. By it, I mean your LLM. That could be a chat GPT clawed by Anthropic again. There's Gemini by Google. Then we have DeepSeek. You have your LLM. You give it a certain input. It could be a text input, audio input, anything. And you get a simple response. But this response is based on the training data that whatever company who has made the tool has used. So this data is predefined. There is not a lot more that you can do except maybe add some more uh, custom training to it. But that's about it. It will give you a certain response. What it does not do on its own is perform tasks for you. It can even research now. All these new models have the capability to research to look up things, look things up on the internet, but they cannot execute tasks for you. For example, if I want to send an email, an LLM can't do it on its own. It needs more components, more tools that it is attached to so that it can execute that particular task, which brings me to step number two. Step number two is, of course, connecting these tools to LLMs. For example, what if I had a very interesting shower thought and I think that, you know what, okay, I'll just record a voice note, upload it on my Google Drive, ask my AI application to download this from my Google Drive, convert that audio file to text and upload it as a tweet right then and there. All right, so that is basically the flow that I'm going for in my step two, and I need to connect some tools to it. So what happens now? What I've done now is I've put my input over here. I've sent it to my LLM or my AI application, which in this case is a voice note, which is uploaded in my drive folder, as I just mentioned. Now this LLM checks what, uh, what tools are available at its disposal. So it, check, it sees that we have a Google Drive API, uh, a model that converts audio to text and my Twitter API that uploads this text in the form of a tweet or any other social media API that is accessible to me. All right. So here, the problem is, there's a small catch before we reach step three. This catch is that this integration over here and over here and over here is completely custom. I have to write a different wrapper to access my Google Drive API. Same goes for my audio text model. Same goes for my Twitter API. It's all custom and it's different for each. So it is a lot of work. If I have a hundred different tools for a very large AI workflow, I simply cannot write a, a wrapper for each of them and have it operate differently. And what if I need to switch one out for another model? 
it's a big headache for me. It becomes quite a task. So what's the point of using AI if I'm just doing all the work myself, right? So that brings me to step number three, which is establishing a standard of communication. And as I've been talking about throughout this video, that is MCP, your model context protocol. So here now we have our LLM, which will have our input as before. And that LLM will contact MCP. MCP will say, okay, fine. You know what? Just give me your input. Let me talk to the AI tools. I know of a way to communicate with them. There is a standard that we've established and then you don't have to implement something custom over here. And so I will talk to all these APIs, for example, my drive API, then my transcribe API, which is an open AI model basically. And then my Twitter API. So what, so then you'll ask, why do I not need to have some custom integrations over here? Well, that is because these AI tools or whoever is writing these AI tools, for example, there's Google over here, there's open AI, there is Twitter. They maintain these tools and they basically make it easily interactable with MCP. So over here we have MCP talking to our three different tools. Why do they do it? Because they want you to use it and you are looking for a standard, right? You want a simpler way of communicating with AI tools. So these companies say, okay, fine. You know what? We will stick to the standard that is developed by Anthropic. We will maintain our own tools and adhere to whatever processes have been laid out. And then you can easily use that process to connect to our tools. And that is simply what is, what the role of MCP is. All right. So here, that's how it all operates. So the next question that you should ask yourself is there are so many components being added to my flowchart over here. How many are there really? So it's basically all this. There is not much more to be added over here. And I'll clarify that by using the example given to us in the official documentation, which is this one over here. And they, the documentation says that you need to have a host, which could simply be your laptop or an application installed on your laptop. For example, you have your cloud desktop application that is given to us by Anthropic. Is that you can have an NCP client over here that is installed on your host. Now this could also be an IDE or an integrated development environment. If you are a developer, this would be something like VS code or sublime, whatever supports your MCP client integration or some other tool created by some other company or something that you may have come up with. So here we have your host with the client installed on it. That client then communicates with your MCP servers or the services that you need to use the tools you need to use using your MCP protocol. This could be nothing but your MCP server that you may have written yourself, which could be like a file manager server. Let's say I want to run the previous example, but completely locally. I don't want to involve drive in it, Google drive in it. So you could have your audio file in some local data source, a, your file manager, which is, uh, you know, manipulated by your MCP server, basically takes care of getting that data. That data is then brought back, communicates with MCP server B with some audio to text model. And that is also maybe stored on your local device over here. So that is then exchanged. The information is sent. The context basically is sent back to your LLM, which then finally uses my Twitter API to post that tweet via a web API, which is accessible via the internet. And that since is an external service, we are calling it a remote service. All right. Those are all the basic components that you can use to make up your MCP workflow. And that, and now you know the components, it is now time to understand the flow of data. How does this work in this entire flow chart? All this flow chart is extremely clear in itself. We still need to dive one level deeper, not too much. So let's go over here to this very nice diagram that I've made for you. So let's go over this step by step. Step number zero, right before the process has started is where I give some input to my host. All right. I give some input, which could be the audio file or the location of the audio file on my Google drive. Let's say <clears throat> that host then tells the client, okay, my client, listen to me, check the list of servers 
this is step one by the way check the list of search the list of tools that is available to you and then you check your list of servers that is returned to your client over here it says okay now you have the list of tools send this to your llm step two send this to your llm and ask okay i have my drive api my audio to text model and my twitter api what tool should i use to perform the certain uh, task that has been given to me now in this case we will be using all three tools obviously but you could have a hundred tools attached over here there could be a hundred client server connections in your workflow so you this llm will basically select which tools are appropriate for a certain task for example if i just want to convert my audio to text i don't need the drive api i don't say so i might need it to download but i don't need my twitter api at all so it will just say okay you just use the drive api and the audio to text model in that case all right that's basically what the llm will do so it will tell me what to use then step three is to actually use the tool so the client will then request the service the relevant service to perform the task that has been assigned to us as part of our input or the defined workflow the predefined workflow maybe so it will use the tools to execute the task this response is then returned to the client and this response or the context i should say is handed to the llm say okay llm this is the information that i have received after using all these tools and this llm will then give us the output it could be anything let's say i want to send an email to someone i give that as an input i say okay send an email to my teammate saying that your task is overdue so it will check that okay i have the gmail api and the and an open ai api that will go back over here and it will go, go to the llm it will say okay you know what my uh, input is that i have to send an api uh, sorry send an email sorry with certain information and the llm will say okay i i have you know these tools the gmail api and the open ai api i will use the open ai api to generate or draft the email and i'll use the gmail api to actually send it and so client says okay i will get the servers to do that that will then come back and then it will give me a response or a context saying that your mail has been sent successfully that could be a potential output that is given to me as the user of this particular ai workflow all right so that is the flow of mcps and how it basically communicates with the different components whether it is the user whether it is the service that is supposed to execute the task whether it is the llm itself that helps us convert our task from a natural language process to an actual application applications uh, usage pattern and so that's basically all i have to talk about in this video in one of the future videos or more of the future videos i will implement this in practice to implement different use cases that could be useful to you that you could maybe even monetize in the future so just stay tuned and follow for more such content thank you for watching